Thank you and good morning. Um, I'm delighted to be here. And as Diana said, um, yes, I'm a teacher. I've always been a teacher. How many of you are or have been a teacher? OK, there you go. So that's my orientation today, is coming from the perspective of a teacher. All right, so I'm focusing our talk today um, in, in order to kind of provoke us to think about what's going on in teacher education, teacher preparation, teacher training. And we'll talk a little bit about the terms that we use to try to decide how do we name this. And I've entitled my talk, with apologies to William Shakespeare, um, What's in a Name? So our first question um, has to do with what do we know about the changes in the teacher workforce currently and how might that have implications for how we support teacher, the teacher learning process. Um, what, are the, what are the names, what are the terms, and what are the nuances associated with this work around how do we talk about teachers, how do we talk about their preparation, how do we talk about the policy, and how do we talk about the research? So let's start by talking about the teacher workforce and its potential relationship to how we think about supporting the teacher learning process. So, currently you'll read the paper, you'll hear different things, and you might get the sense that there is this impending crisis in the teacher workforce for a variety of reasons. Um, on the other hand, maybe there's a little bit of chicken little going on here. So let's look at sort of those two sides of the coin. So on the one hand, yes, there is decline in teacher preparation enrollment across the country. We know that that's the case right now. However, that decline is flat in some areas, and we have a surplus in teachers in a lot of other areas. Here in New England, we have a surplus of elementary educators. We know that. And we have areas of need where we're either flat or we're really struggling. We have an aging teacher workforce. There's been a lot of talk about what happens when you know, all of these baby boomers retire. Well, true, but we also need to look at that a little bit more closely. So we need to look at the teacher workforce in general and think about who's staying, as in staying in that classroom, in that school, in that community. Who's moving? Who's moving from classroom to classroom, moving from school to school, moving from district to district, moving from state to state? And who's leaving? Who are the leavers? We also know that there's a national K-12 student enrollment increase. However, in some states, there's a decline. So you have to be kind of careful when you look at you know, generalities versus more specifics. How is it contextualized? How are we looking at some of these issues? So in a lot of places, um, these teacher shortages that we're experiencing are framed as a problem. And sure, we can identify that there are problems there, but there are also opportunities. I know you've probably heard the much overused Chinese character for crisis that says that there's danger and opportunity together in crisis. So if we have a crisis, hopefully there's opportunity here. And if we frame it as opportunity, that may change the direction in which we move forward. All right, let's take a look at the teacher workforce. We know that the teacher workforce is getting larger, not just because our own population is getting larger, but, sorry, <laughs> but that the, the, the actual no relative numbers of teachers out in the workforce is, is growing significantly. That population of teachers is getting both grayer in the sense that we have a real peak of older teachers, significantly people who are well into their um, into the profession, and we also have a greener teacher workforce. We have another peak with very younger, very less experienced, and so there are these two peaks with kind of a trough in the middle. We also know that the teacher workforce is less diverse with respect to gender. There are more women in teaching now relative to men than there were previously. But we also know the teaching workforce is more diverse with respect to race and ethnicity. Another area that has gotten under a lot of scrutiny is the fact that the teacher workforce has been very consistent decade after decade after decade with respect to academic ability. And by the way, we know that the relationship between academic ability and teacher quality is anything but clear. <laughs> 
But we do know that over time, the academic ability of teachers um, has not been particularly high, but it has been consistent. We also know that the teacher workforce currently is quite unstable. We have lots and lots of teachers moving from high poverty to low poverty schools, from suburban, I'm sorry, from urban to suburban schools, from poor schools to not poor schools. So there's a fair amount of instability in the teacher workforce. And there's very little research around these trends, which I would argue have pretty significant implications. So it's kind of like, are we in a back to the future place here with an older, very female workforce? So, and what implications does that have for the, the people that come into the system that we want to um, have engage in successful learning about teaching? All right. Similarly, we know that in our student population, the minority is becoming the majority. And the teacher workforce currently doesn't reflect, represent, or effectively support much of student, family, and community populations. I'm not saying that it's not happening, but we know that there are, that there are some areas where it's not. And so what do we focus on here? Here we come back to this idea of what's in a name. Do we focus on the workforce that doesn't reflect our students, that doesn't represent our students, that doesn't support our students, where should our emphasis be? All right, as we go through this morning, I'm gonna kind of poke and prod a little bit with respect to the terms that we use, the names that we use. So for example, we can talk about accountability and we can talk about responsibility. Those are two different ways of talking about the same general idea. We can talk about recruitment and we can talk about retention. We now know that if we're looking for continuing to diversify the teacher workforce, we should be focusing much more on retention than on recruitment. That's where we're gonna get the more bang for our buck. We can think about how do we train, my least favorite word, train teachers, how do we prepare teachers, how do we educate teachers, how do we professionalize teachers. Those are all four different terms focusing on the same process and yet I'd argue that they have very, very different implications. If we're talking about teacher learning, why do we talk about preparing teachers at the higher ed level? Preparing them for what? Aren't, aren't teachers always learning? Are we only preparing them for that leap from college to their first years of teaching? I'd say no, I say that teacher learning is an arc, so the words we use are important. Are we looking at causal or correlational? Do lay people, do the general public, do parents of kids in schools, do our policymakers understand the difference between causal and correlational with respect to research? Then there's the idea of ex ante and ex post. How do we decide who's ready to learn about becoming a teacher? Ex ante, we're talking about forecasting. We're talking about using standardized test measures to determine who is allowed to enter the possibility of learning about teaching versus ex post measures where we actually assess the teaching event, the teaching practice. And then I'm gonna conclude a little bit with respect to what I believe is one of the most important issues here, which is equity. So all of us as educators, I hope that we would all agree that in our country, we are hoping for a very strong educational process for all of our students, not some of our students, all of our students, regardless of zip code, and equity becomes a really important issue here. All right, so now it's your turn. What I'd like you to do is take a minute, and literally I'm only gonna give you a minute, to turn to your colleague and ask, what caught your attention and why, with respect to those different terms we can think about in the different ideas? Where are you coming from? How do your own biases, assumptions, orientation experiences impact how you see the questions, how you see the issues, and I promise I'll tell you how they impact mine. All right, so take a minute and talk to your neighbor. 
okay up there? With yep, the everything's fine. All good. Nope, okay. thank you. Good, thank you. A lot of preps. Thank you. Yep, you do. It's going smooth. All right, thanks everybody. That was literally a minute. Thank you for coming back. I hope you had a good initial conversation that you'll be able to continue in your breakout sessions. All right, so let's, let's move forward with some of these ideas. So let's take a look at the research. So research by any other name, would it still smell so sweet? Sorry, Will. All right, our second focus question looks at what do we know about research on teacher education, teacher preparation? teacher training, teacher learning. What do we know? So we know that the research on teacher education is disjointed. We lack a common language. We lack a common agenda. We know, as I mentioned earlier, that the words, the terms we use are important, and that without precision and without common understanding, there's inevitable confusion and misunderstanding. Sometimes that's unintentional, and I think we have some cases where we can argue that the, sometimes that's deliberate to divide us. In 2002, Wilson, Floden, and Farini Mundy embarked on a pretty significant project taking a look at the current body of teacher preparation research. They wanted to get a handle on these five key questions. What did we know about these areas and how did that impact how we might move forward. So they asked questions about the content preparation of teachers, the pedagogical preparation, their clinical training. They looked at the policies and strategies to improve teacher preparation. They looked at high quality alter alternative preparation. And unfortunately, what they found was that the research was inconclusive. I find that a little bit scary. <laughs> as a dean of a school of education, right? So what, what did they have to say about this? Why, why did they feel that it was inconclusive? What they believed was that the research that we have conducted to that date had been small scale and interpretivist research. So that is a little bit limiting. It's pretty insular. We're only talking to each other. There's a gap in our research between the claims that we make and the evidence that we use to support it. There's a dearth of impact measures. There's lack of attention to the kinds of evidence that researchers are using to support their arguments. And they pose the question as to whether this is all due to the quote unquote soft social science nature of our work. And a lot of our cr critics will use that idea against us. They noted also that there's very little research on policies intended to improve the quality of pre-service education. That doesn't mean we don't have policies because we do. We have a lot of policies, but we have very little research on those policies. So they wrote in 2002, we worry that unless we, as teacher educators and researchers, produce sound, robust measures of impact, others, policymakers and critics, will produce other, less appropriate measures. So that was 2002. So here I want to bring in this idea of looking at the terms, looking at the names we use again when it comes to the research, when it comes to the policy, and when it comes to the practice. Accountability is a pretty hot topic right now, right? Accountability measures, the accountability movement. The accountability idea has really become the pervasive normalizing discourse for us right now. Um, the term has really legitimized what is seen as a shift from education as a cultural and social good to education as an economic imperative, this idea of accountability. Fifteen years ago, you really couldn't find the word accountability in the research. This is, this is a pretty new orientation. So we're going to kind of tease apart these two ideas as, as behind this idea of what's in a name. How do we name? How do we frame? What are the nuances associated with the way we conceptualize things? So currently, um, this 
I hope you can see this. I'll walk you through it a little bit. This idea of mapping teacher preparation to the learning that happens for the teacher and that teacher learning to the practice that that teacher engages in and that teacher practice to the learning of students is currently kind of considered the holy grail of teacher education research. People talk about the missing links. So we're trying to then wrap back from student learning to the preparation, the education, the training that teachers had at the college level. So any, any one of these steps has a whole range of variables and contexts that I think are fascinating, right? W what are all the variables? What are all the things you have to think about when you're thinking about what's the relationship between the preparation experience that a teacher candidate has and that teacher's learning? That step alone is phenomenally fascinating. And yet we're trying to take all of these steps so that we can wrap back around to make connections to the preparation from the student outcome, the student learning outcome. All right, so I promised you that I'd come clean on my own biases, my own assumptions, my own orientations. All right, so I was a classroom teacher for many, many years. I went back to Harvard University, got my master's, focused, began to focus a lot on the idea of multicultural education, working with urban students, looking at teacher learning in urban areas. I then went back and got my PhD at Boston College under the direct support, mentoring, and supervision of Marilyn Cochran Smith. I am very heavily influenced by her work. My orientation is grounded in that seminal work I engaged in with her. And I own that, and I'm, I'm willing to acknowledge that, and I think it's important that we all get to that point. So you will see her work embedded here, and my own work, which I'll share a little bit about, is also oriented. We're coming from the same place, is, is what I'm saying, all right? So just recently at ARA, how many of you are at ARA? All right, and so if you heard her spoke, she's been talking about this idea of accountability. She's talking about what, what and, and I'm taking what she's talking about to help us look at what's going on in these words that we choose. So if you look in the dictionary and if you begin to talk to people about, in general, when you use the word accountability, what are you talking about? Well, we're usually talking about some form of blame. There's accountability implies that there's an explanation required for some failure. Ac accountability also implies that you are to be answerable. So when we go back to those steps between the missing link, the, the holy grail of teacher education, if we are looking at accountability from what happens in teacher preparation to what happens with student outcomes, there's this idea that teacher preparation better be held accountable, better be answerable for those student learning outcomes. Accountability tends to be focused in areas that are hierarchical and tends to be focused in a bureaucratic structure. When you look up responsibility, when you ask people associations with responsibility, Responsibility is generally considered to be something that's shared. Responsibility is, con is considered to be something that's professional, and responsibility is considered to be something that is action-oriented. So, what do you think? How do the subtle differences in the terminology impact our research, our practice, our poli policy, like this idea between the difference between accountability versus responsibility. And here are a few of those other terms to sort of prompt you as you take another minute to turn to your neighbor and have a short conversation. 
is food for thought. You'll have more time later in the morning for conversation. I hope that got you started. So let's continue to look at some of the research. In 2005, the AERI panel, um, under the direction of Marilyn Cochran Smith and Ken Zeichner, began to try to develop what they hoped would be a thorough, rigorous, even-handed analysis of the empirical evidence related to the policies and practices of teacher education. And they wanted to improve upon our research agenda. So here's what they did. They offered a critique of over 500 peer-reviewed studies of pre-service teacher education from, two, from 1990 to 2003, building on the work with, from Floden, uh, Wilson Floden and Farini Mundi. The studies were carefully vetted against explicit standards of quality. They noted the newly emerging policy imperative is currently forcing questions that have not been asked of other professions at all, nor have they been previously asked in teacher education. So it's important to recognize some of these big shifts. Shaylock, Shaylock, and Ayers referenced the AAR panel in their analysis of this work and noted that the report confirms beyond question earlier findings exposing the limited ability of our research base in answering questions pertaining to policy or practice concerning the preparation and licensing of teachers. Holy cow, right? This is a little bit frightening. This is pretty interesting. Opportunity, crisis, problem? I'm, I'm going to go with opportunity, all right? <laughs> they highlighted the need for an infrastructure for research on teacher education with strategic and collaborative partners. So that's why all you, you are all here, collaborative partnerships, in order to address what Cochrane Smith calls the, the idea of this unforgiving complexity of teaching. They noted that this would be a long and expensive undertaking due to the range and complexity of variables and the near to endless variety of contexts all our different schools, all our different educator preparation programs, all of these different things going on. So where do we focus? Where do we focus our research on this issue? Are we going to focus on the research on training teachers, on preparing, on educating, on professionalizing? Are we going to focus on this idea of ex ante, of assessment before the teaching event happens? That's currently what's going on with CAPE, the Council for Accreditation of Educator Preparation, and the idea of a state basic skills requirement, where in order to be entering into the major of education or into an educator program, you need to meet certain requirements. Or are we going to look also and or or at ex post, the idea of results rather than forecasts, the idea of performance-based assessment, the idea of um, thinking about what, what, what really matters when we're looking at the threshold of, of what's, what makes for a qualified teacher. So Kane, Rockoff, and Steger, interestingly, found that while selection is important, performance is much more important than certification. What they found is that between uncertified, certified, and alt-certified teachers, the academic achievement outputs of students, they, they were indistinguishable and that it was the teacher's first two years of teaching that had a greater impact on determining student outcomes than any kind of certification status. So that raises, I think, some really interesting questions as well. So we begin to think about questions like, are teacher tests valid predictors of teaching performance? What kinds of tests are valid? I'll talk a little bit in a moment about the professional threshold for entry, ideas that are happening out of teaching works at the University of Michigan, and the idea of a national ob observational teaching exam. So our third question talks about what are the potential new directions for preparation of teachers, especially in our highest need schools. So here's an interesting example. At the University of Michigan, the, uh, this organization called Teaching Works aims to transform teacher preparation in the US by developing a consensus around a threshold of practice for entry. The, where, do we, where do we need people to be in order to start this process? They received a huge grant to develop this broad transformation in teacher preparation. They looked at the idea of focusing on high leverage practices. What are those practices that are really going to give teachers a lot of bang for their buck? Things like leading a group discussion, diagnosing patterns of student thinking. And of course, many of these are embedded in the standards and competencies um, that we're already looking at. They looked at high leverage content. They looked at things like, you know, a teacher needs to know about place value in mathematics, identifying literary themes in English language arts, 
the Common Core Standards help us with this. We want to focus on those specific content areas that students often struggle with. They received a grant to establish a Teacher Preparation Transformation Center. And the Teacher Preparation Transformation Center Initiative, PTCI, we love our acronyms, um, is designed to create a diverse national network of teacher education providers that will build, both independently and collectively, effective pathways for the preparation of beginning teachers. One of the questions that I'm constantly asking myself as the dean of an educator uh, preparation program is what, what do we know, what do I know based on my own research about what proves for successful learning, particularly for urban teachers? So I ask myself, and I continue to ask, what is the ecology of schooling? What's the ecology of teacher education? What are these multiple variables and contexts? How do we help teachers to learn from, with students, as well as about them? What would a continuum of meaningful learning for teaching look like, bridging this divide, this historical divide between educator preparation and the learning that happens um, when they're teachers of record? I focused on practice-focused curriculum, moving teacher learning out, not just back, so that it does, teacher learning shouldn't just happen in the pre-service area, right? We know that, we do PD, we do all these things, but we need to think about how we look at that and to consider the conditions of learning. So briefly, in my own research, I found that successful teachers, beginning teachers in urban contexts, if they were able to get this idea of getting to we, learning about, but also learning with and from students, many were able to develop a more transformational teaching practice. Those teachers were more likely, it's hard to see those, that bottom slide, but more, more likely on the left-hand side, were likely to grow professionally and confidently. But even if they struggled unhappily, they sometimes could get there. And they got there if, and this is where I think about what does this mean for teacher education, they got there if they were able to engage in individual agency. Could they take risks? Would they accept challenges? Could they determine the difference between realistic and unrealistic expectations? Are they able to make real concrete decisions and take action on them? Could they seek resources? Do we teach that in teacher education? These teachers that were successful had deep commitments, deep commitments to children, deep commitments to the process of learning, deep commitments to staying in urban education, deep commitments to social change. This is the idea of dispositions that we talk about with respect to teachers. These successful beginning teachers, as they moved from pre-service to in-service, they were able to focus effectively on four tasks of learning to teach, four tasks about the process of learning about teaching. They were able to personalize the profession, personalize the job of teaching, personalize their own learning process. They were able to contextualize it. They could look at these multiple factors. They could say, these are the students in front of me right now, not some generic group of students. They were able to problematize and didn't get freaked out by problems. There were problems to solve. They were opportunities. They weren't problems necessarily. And they were able to politicize teaching and learning. They also had particular conditions in their schools. Their roles and responsibilities were clear, not muddy. Their school and classroom cultures were positive and thriving. And they got the appropriate support, and they were part of a community. So what would teacher preparation look like along those guidelines. So finally, I'm coming back to this idea of equity. So I ask myself, on what evidence are teacher and teacher education accountab accountability measures based? And I was fascinated to read the most recent article by Cochrane Smith and her group at Boston College that talks about this idea of thin versus thick equity. So unfortunately, what they found is that there is thin evidence for four of the main measures that we use in the accountability movement. So three are the Higher Education Opportunity Act regulations, the Council for Accreditation of Educator Preparation, CAPE accreditation, and the National Council on Teacher Quality, NCTQ reviews. They found very thin evidence to support the claims of those organizations. There was more support for EdTPA which I'm sure many of your states are using. So thin equity, this idea of thin equity, assumes that teachers are the major source of educational inequality, even though this is a conclusion that's not based in evidence. 
There are many social structures, many systems in our country that produce and reproduce educational inequality, not just teachers. This idea of thick equity acknowledges these multiple factors, this ecology that influence student achievement, as well as the complex and intersecting systems that create the inequality in the first place. So, what are the research questions we should be asking? What's driving these questions? Which questions will produce usable information? Which will result in teacher education change and improvement, not simply blame and deprofessionalization? So again, with apologies to Will, <laughs> do the terms, do the words we use in our research, in our policies, in our classrooms, do they create worth? Do they create meaning? What impact do these names, these terms we use, have on our own thinking, our questions, our intent, our outcomes? What names will you choose, will you use? I stand before you saying that as a teacher educator, as a teacher, I stand for clarity, I stand for collaboration, I stand for equity and quality, and I stand for responsibility, and I hope you'll join me. So, a rose by any other name, what will be yours, and will it still smell as sweet? Thank you. <laughs>